next speaker is Dan Morgan, who's the digital science publisher at the University of California Press and publisher of Calabra, the press's OA mega journal. He joined the UC Press. UC Press, that's kind of confusing. <laughs> uh, we, we have that problem all the time. Yeah. <laughs> in June 2014, to focus on mission driven, not for profit digital initiatives. He has worked in scholarly publishing for over 13 years in publishing management, research, open access, and strategy roles. All of that time was at Elsevier, where he ended up the head of the Psychology and Cognitive Sciences Journals Department, then Senior Manager for Open Access and Other Outreach for North America. He is a passionate advocate for open access, open science, and advancing scholarly communication. When he isn't thinking about Calabra, he enjoys playing guitars in bands, films, bands, films, craft cocktails, thriller novels, and dogs. His Twitter handle is at DJJ Morgan. Dan. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting both UC Presses to speak at this. Um, yeah, I kind of had to keep checking that, you know, I definitely called ourselves California um, just to get rid of any kind of confusion there. Garrett, thank you for that. It was a kind of, in a way, a perfect introduction or setup, as you, as you told me before, to kind of some of the things that we're going to try and, well, that we're doing at California now. So um, first slide, University of California Open Press. Just a quick introduction to who I am and you know, what I am doing at the press. University of California Press has set up and is incubating a small digital team. Right now, there are two core members, myself and my manager, Neil Blair Christensen. We're both escapees from corporate publishing. So if you want any kind of secrets or kind of confirmation that, uh, what, that what Garrett said was true there, I can certainly give it to you. Um, but today, um, under the title of New Modes of Publishing, yes, I am going to be focusing on Calabra, um, our new open access journal. But I'm also going to be talking about um, Luminos, um, our new open access books program, and how the community is utilized in different ways for both of these new products and new projects. Um, I'm going to presume I'll have time because we're running so early, so I'm definitely going to go into kind of future directions at the press. Um, so not just what we've gotten off the ground, but um, what we're thinking of doing as well. So, as I said, uh, many of you will know us as the other UC Press. Um, we're based in Oakland, California, where I reside as well, with a non-profit publishing organization within the public University of California system. We are part of UCOP, which is the UC Office of the President. A lot of times, because we were originally based in Berkeley, people associated us too much with the Berkeley campus. But we are the UC that represents all of the, the 10 campuses as well. Um, founded in 1893, um, similar to University of Chicago Press, to publish the books and the papers of the university. Um, we've also got a history of championing a lot of work that influences public discourse and is um, progressive and challenges the establishment and status quo. And uh, I leave these titles in your imagination to figure out how they might relate to certain discussions around big publishing and scholarly communication. But with the newly formed digital team and an open roadmap, and some foundation funding. Um, myself and Neil, we, we decided like, well, what, what do we want to tackle first? You know, we're not inheriting any projects. We're not running the existing books and the existing journals. We've got an open roadmap um, to tackle what we want. So what are we going to start looking at? So we obviously needed like some starting points and some hypotheses and theses just to look into. So one of these was we were very interested, as I said, escaping the corporate publishing world to start thinking of how can you define publishers and, and, what, and what they do and what we have done. Um, and we, we decided to kind of make lists of publishers that kind of help circulate value and leverage the network and the community and the ones that, I mean, arguably just seem to extract value from the community. Um, the tangible success of journals publishing um, with all the publishers in play is very narrowly distributed. And when I say value, I mean, I'm saying value and not revenue because I'm incorporating both non-profit and for-profit money flows. But I mean, in all senses, uh, tangible value like money or labor. Um, I'm not talking about prestige or recognition, recognition, not because they're not important, but I'm talking, when I talk about value circulation, I'm talking about like these tangible things. Um, so yes, I mean, could, could the people, sh could, more of the stakeholders that contribute to the scholarly communications ecosystem share in the success that is clearly generated by the scholarly communications ecosystem because so many contribute to it. So that was all a fast introduction to get to talking about what we've actually done. So Calabra. 
It's a gold open access mega journal supported by article processing charges, um, operating the scientific and methodological and ethical peer review process only, so the one that was really pioneered by PLOS One. Um, we're publishing articles with the CCBY um, license um, with required open data and optional open peer review. But this is the image that is the crux of Clavera, and this is where I will kind of wander over here. So this is, um, is this still audible when I'm working over here? Okay. So I'll, I'll just go through this. I mean, it's, it's a fairly simple flowchart, but the, each of these kind of points is of particular importance to what we're attempting to do with Calabra. Um, up, um, upon acceptance, and we've got two boxes leading into the article processing charge. Um, obviously, the author or the funder or the institution is the, is the pot of money that um, usually pays for the article processing charge. And uh, as per many of the journals that operate the APC model, we have a waiver option for um, authors who can um, show that they have no funding to pay for these articles. But whilst we're going to call it a waiver, we're actually, it is actually effectively a sponsorship. No, whether or not we waive the fee, whether or not the author or the funder institution has to pay the article processing charge, money will be injected into that system. And our article processing charge is low at $875. I'll focus first of all on this number, the 625. This is strictly the, the, what you would traditionally call the article processing charge for Collabora. This is the part that comes to us as the publisher to pay for the high quality um, publishing services that we are going to offer at the journal. So it's not just hosting, um, this is going to pay, subsidize the submission review system, editorial assistance, all the administration that goes on behind the scenes to administer this the production and platform, the contribution to overheads, and all the marketing. So it's, uh, we elected to just start from scratch, go from the ground up. I can speak from experience here where very many article processing charges in the industry today are essentially mapped against existing open access journals, or they're just mapped against what they believe the market is able to effectively bear, or they're just a transition of a legacy margin from a subscription business model to an open access business model. So yes, yeah, certainly some journals are doing this, but we definitely and transparently want to just say, what does it cost for us to be able to do that which we want to do for the articles that are accepted in Collabora? And we just built it from the ground up, trying to keep it as lean and mean as possible, and working with partners to enable us to do this at scale immediately, even though we're starting from scratch. I'll talk about how we've been able to do this a little bit later on by partnership. But really, $625 is where we are with being able to offer kind of top-level publishing services. Um, I'll focus now on the kind of the bottom right-hand corner, which is really the unique selling point of Collabora. You saw there, $250 goes into what we're terming the Research Community Fund for every accepted article. So $250 of that $875 total APC. That just goes in there and it sits there. It's for every accepted article, but it just sits there. And every, um, at given points in the year, um, in the early days, we're gonna do it every quarter, but ultimately once we scale up, we believe we're gonna do this, switch, switch this to every month. We're going to essentially share this revenue, share this value with the people that have contributed to our system. So it's the senior editors, editors and reviewers that work on the journal. Now, senior editors, editors, and reviewers will earn points by working on articles. And what it is, it's not really a fee for service. Everyone's kind of, a lot of the early headlines about Collabra have said, this is the journal that pays peer reviewers. It's really a little bit more complex than that. It's about all of the participants in the system earning points, and at given points in the year, those points convert into a share of the money that is in the research community fund. So, you know, in, at every quarter, a reviewer will say, you have handled, um, you've been involved with three submissions, your share of the value that has been generated by the journal this quarter is X. And with this X amount of money, you have now have three choices. And I'll go through those choices. You can pay the earnings forward, or in a way back, to your library or institutional or organization's open access budget. So it, it can be extracted completely from the Calabra universe. You can pay the earnings forward to our journal waiver fund. One of the first things I said, we've got that sponsorship fund at the top that covers authors unable to pay. So that will be topped up by earnings paid forward by reviewers and editors that work on the journal. 
And to show that this is, again, not some lock-in scheme, editors, editors and reviewers will be allowed to pay themselves. So again, it's not really we pay editors and reviewers, it's editors and reviewers can elect to pay their earnings to themselves if they so wish. This is the thing, this is the element that, uh, everyone's been very welcoming of this model. I mean, this is the one that's prompted kind of the, some of the most discussion on Twitter, you know, should, should reviewers get paid? But I really do want to emphasize that notion. It's not us saying there's a flat fee for service, you do a review, you get this amount of money. It's more about sharing and involving the community that works on this journal with the decision making that goes on about the value that this journal generates. So three options, pay the earnings forward, um, to your institution, pay the earnings forward to our waiver fund, or pay the earnings forward to yourself. Um, I mentioned uh, some of the roles at the journal already, senior editors, editors, and reviewers. Um, we're going for a gradual start, so really, I suppose, I, I've already called it a mega journal, but then I, I guess the strict definition of a mega journal is one that is in all fields of science. Our aim is to be in all fields of science and social science and scholarship, but uh, our gradual start is we're focusing on these three very broad areas. And uh, at the helm of these three ed areas will be senior editors who are helping me in kind of um, acquiring a very large roster of handling editors that are required at any um, open access mega journal to handle and to be able to scale and uh, to be able to represent um, as many fields as possible within these three broad fields. So uh, that's one of the other things that we hope will differentiate Calabra in that we're going to have very visible senior editors at the helm of the journal uh, and not just that very large roster of academic editors or handling editors or what, what they tend to get called in this kind of environment. Um, how have we been able to get started so quickly and so efficiently? Well, it's easy. It's not easy, but um, I'm going to tell you it's easy. It's the, the key thing is to not build everything yourself. I mean, it's, that's the natural reaction. A lot of the problems with transition is we still presume that for me to start an open access mega journal at the University of California Press, I have to hire a whole bunch of people. I have to build like new workflows and things. Fact of the matter is, is that we are going to partner with a London-based uh, company called Ubiquity Press that were, and, you know, actually coincidentally, one of the other publishers that really started to break down the article processing charge and what the elements actually paid for. And so they're already operating at a fairly good scale, so immediately we can start to offer those efficient publishing services by simply partnering with them. And uh, they obviously, we will pay them a, a share of the 625 that comes to us. You know, part of that is the overhead that will be paid out to Ubiquity Plus. But in addition to a lot of the services and tools that we're going to have um, on our journal, we're going to run the PLOS article level metrics to be the, uh, you know, to, to measure the downloads and the shares and all the other things that that system is able to record on each article. Um, right now, Ubiquity Press has post-publication commenting on its platform, but Ubiquity and we are talking to Hypothesis, a San Francisco-based firm that's into the open annotation of all the web. And um, so we have a hope in the future that post-publication commentary or really anything that extends the life cycle of activity around articles could be you know, very smartly provided by companies such as Hypothesis. Um, Authoria and Overleaf, just two, two um, companies I picked out of the air that are into collaborat or collaborative authoring. Ubiquity Press is already working with them so that there's going to be able to be direct submissions out of some of these services. And um, we're also very, very, you know, I, I, it's in my introduction, I'm not just fascinated by open access, but open science in general and transparency. Um, so there's a University of Virginia kind of spin out company called the Center for Open Science um, that we're gonna work very closely with and develop things like pre-registered reports and kind of ensuring, you know, there's a, an article type where you can say what you are going to do before you do it so that you can get a kind of in principle acceptance of your methods. Um, and, but, you know, but the Center for Open Science is very, very effectively kind of, you know, doing the work for us that we, I might have otherwise wanted to explore around open science and how you can share your kind of methods and data in advance of doing research. But instead of doing it ourselves, we're going to partner with Center for Open Science to do that. So uh, the mission is clear. It's innovation by collaboration, which I'm delighted is the theme of this year's Open Access Week. And we decided this prior to that. 
But the benefits for all, I mean, Calabra is about, as I've already explained from the model, it's not about locking that value in. It's not about circulating the value just to our own waiver fund. It's about enabling by authors being able to pay forward the value to their institution's open access fund, which would go pay for a different author to publish in a different open access journal. So the, it's a very much a, the idea of the benefits are meant to be for everybody, and the innovation is, is by everybody also. You know, we're not locking in the innovation and the ideas, nor the value output just to the journal. So a, a quick recap, just to double check, I haven't missed anything. Yes, mission first. I mean, that was, the, journal was, the journal's genesis was just starting with a principle and a mission, an idea. Could we do something that shares tangible value in an operational, rather than discretionary way. And hopefully we'll be able to show that. A mega journal made up of community journals. As I said, the senior editors are gonna play in a very important community role at a mega journal. We're gonna, I, I'm trying, I'm aiming for you know, a large journal that you would actually, you would say things like Calabra Psychology. I mean, Calabra Psychology isn't the name of a journal, but I want the people that publish in the psychology, psychology articles in Calabra to say that. I want them to feel that they're part of that little kind of community within the journal. I want there to be a collabora of genomics, etc. That's That's how I would envision, envisage it. As I said, the low article processing charge from scratch, which um, and a part of which, which enables us to share and spread actual value. No lock-in, as I said. Optional open review, I haven't really talked about that. Open review, obviously a huge topic in itself. We could have a whole day's conversation about kind of innovation in the peer review model. Right now, um, we have it. It's, it's really a request in the cover letter. Authors can request an open peer review. Um, after, and if the article is accepted, and uh, there would be a kind of a raw output in a template format of the comments made in the peer review process, um, will be published alongside the article. If you, if you take a look at journals like F1000 Research, um, Peer J, you, know, you can see examples of how that's already in practice right now. Um, I mentioned the plus one style of review, the scientific and methodological and ethical credibility only, which one of my least favorite phrases in Skullcom today is peer review light. I think, I, I mean, arguably, I mean, perhaps it's my paranoia, but I, I get the feeling that the company I once worked for might have invented that phrase when plus one came out to try and kind of insinuate a kind of lack of rigor there. but. Um, if you ever want like a really good tangible example of what peer review light actually looks like, take a look. As many of you might be familiar with the, the Bohannon sting operation. Anyone ever heard of that? It's when a, um, John Bohannon sent a fake paper to lots of open access journals and uh, to see whether it would you know, get in. If you look at the kind of the, the data that he releases behind the scenes um, about the interactions with a lot of the journals, and you see the kind of the, the checking and the rigor that PLOS One employed to ensure that that didn't get through the gate. I mean, that's a more rigorous technical check than I can honestly say ever would have gone on in any of the journals I looked after in Elsevier. So peer review light, really, what that, that just phrase should be eradicated, and I'm gonna try and change it to selective for credibility only. The notion is it's not just getting up to a minimum standard of scholarship. We're talking about tr removing subjectivity as much as possible from the decision to publish this article. I mean, I want the rigor. I, I want editors checking for whether the, the, you know, the, the experiments are adequately powered, checking all these kinds of things that can be just objectively written down in the peer review form as please check these things and give it your absolute best rigorous peer review, but just don't tell me or don't decide whether this is relevant or original enough or kind of sexy enough. Again, a weird phrase to use in, in that kind of context, but that's, you know, I'm, I'm using the phrases that get used all the time. So I'm going to try and change, we're going to try and change that conversation to being selective for credibility only and just get rid of that entire phrase, peer review light. There's nothing light about it, or at least that's where we'd like to go. And more, more open access for all. I'll just, you know, that, that's the end of my summary of Calabra. Um, this isn't just about ensuring the success of this journal only. We are really genuinely trying to ensure the success of the open access ecosystem and the model. And I, I will say that one, one of the questions we got asked um, by the, the open access journalist, Richard Poinder, was, well, with this 
with this experiment, I mean, I, I hesitate to call it experiment because we are committed to doing this, but with this you know, evolution of open access publishing, is this you saying that you believe the article processing charge open access business model is the one you're banking on for the future? And I, and I would categorically say, for now, it is. I mean, we can't do this. We don't have an institution to be able to sponsor this wholesale. Um, you know, I, I'm interested in the PRJ model of a much more membership and, you know, the, 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 the model not at the moment of transaction of an article. I'm very interested in observing that. But for right now, for what we want to do, the, the, the kind of the point we want to prove, article processing charge open access is the business model that we can employ to do that. But APC supported open access is not a business model by design. It's a business model by necessity. I mean, ultimately in the future, I would love to kind of I, I want a collaborator to have the open access model that best supports its mission. And if that is a different open access model in 10 years time, then so be it. So I'm, I'm categorically saying that right now, this model allows us to do what we want to do as of right now. But this is not us, University of California Press, saying APC supported open access is the way to go. And we don't like the institutionally funded or the, you know, the membership model of PRJ. Um, I'm sure there'll be time for questions at the end, so um, I'll just move right ahead to Luminos. Now, I'm more on the periphery of this, uh, this project, so I'll have to refer to my notes a little bit more. Um, let me see. So, um, Calabra is us, University of California Press, evolving an activity that other publishers have been doing and one that we have previously not done before. Whereas Luminos, you know, these things will get lumped into the two open access projects occurring at UC Press, and you know, we obviously do a lot of co-presentation co of the two topics. But it's important to note that Luminos, however, is doing exactly what we have been doing and have become very famous for doing, but just in a different way. So, you know, it, it's, 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 it's interesting, the kind of the dif differentiation between the two, but they both are about utilizing the community in a, in a different direction as well. Collabora is about spreading the value out to the community, and as I'm about to show you, Luminos is about spreading the risk and the, uh, the costs around the community. So, again, why are we doing this? Why is the University of California Press investing so much into an open access book program? Well, Garrett touched on this a little bit. I mean, budgets for books, and especially the types of books that university presses are known for publishing, uh, the budgets for these from libraries are being squeezed out, you know, by many things, but, you know, the, the classic tale is by large-scale journal packages. And university presses have a history, and some might argue, the actual specific responsibility to ensure that the great scholarship that might otherwise not make it into the world makes it into the world. So Luminos is about offering much more choice to authors and make book getting back to knowing that you're making a book publishing decision based on the merit of the work and not about your projected size of the audience. And it's, you know, it will ensure that important scholarly work will reach the widest possible audience. Of course, the side bonus is, and not the main reason of doing it, but the side bonus for going to any uh, more digital model here as well, is that there are going to be much more multimedia and digital possibilities in an open access books program. So how? Um, the open access publishing costs will be shared across the community. And the publishing costs, if you think about you know, the APCs for journals, I mean, again, I was telling you about Collabora, like lowering it down to 875. But you know, the article processing charges for journal articles hover somewhere between $500 and $5,000. But if you think about book chapters and books and the amount of effort that goes into those, the, the APC, or rather the BPC, the book processing charge that you might imagine in such a model, is always going to be prohibitive. So, I mean, this is not the only experiment of this kind. I believe knowledge and latch and a lot of um, experiments are going on of this type. But it's about breaking the costs down into manageable, manageable amounts for various stakeholders in the system. Obviously, the author and the author's institution is one of them. But libraries will be invited to participate. And also, since it's entirely common for university presses to um, provide uh, funds for the publishing of books anyway, UC Press will continue to provide funds for publishing books open access too. And um, two channels get created by opening a, a book publishing program like this is that we can also help support it with the print-on-demand sales of any print copies sold 
and uh, waiver funds as well. I mean, Calabra has its waiver fund, but Luminos will operate um, a waiver fund with any of the surplus that may be generated. So the baseline BPC, as it were, or title publication cost, we've gotten down to $15,000, but no, no single entity pays that amount of money. Um, it's about spreading that between the four, um, four sources that are on the left-hand side there. The authors or the author institution's contribution is the baseline $7,500. Um, the library subsidy comes from libraries electing to join um, the Luminos Books Publishing Program. The UC Press subsidy will be provided um, as necessary. And as I said before, the revenue from the print sales um, will um, be added into that model as well. Um, libraries will elect to contribute money. On the next slide, I'll show you that we've actually decided to, um, we originally set it that uh, each participating library would just contribute $1,000 a year, and uh, 2,000 from that large pot would come out to subsidize every monograph. But um, we're delighted to report that uh, many libraries have just said, well, heck, we'd like to pay even more than $1,000. So please, can we pay you more? To which we said, of course. <laughs> Um, so this is what happens when you do mission-driven work. Um, so now we're allowing, um, we've kind of set up, I, presumably some marketing person set up, a, <laughs> I, I'm not responsible for this, um, courier level, Garamond level, Hel Helvetica level, you know, and uh, the Futura level of uh, library membership support. And um, of course this doesn't mean anything, you can, everyone can still access all of these books, etc. but um, uh, we've decided to recognize, you know, all of these levels have, uh, have slightly increasing levels of recognition, um, primarily kind of percentages off the publication fees and uh, discounted other books. And, um, you know, and if required, the joining of the, the advisory board. Um, so just, you know, kind of re some recap details. Luminos is not replacing um, the traditional monograph program. It is merely extending it with that mission as I, allow, I outlined at the start to ensure that um, these books can reach their widest possible audience and to, again, I hesitate to use the word experiment, to, but just to prove that we can spread the costs around all the interested stakeholders in the community. Um, once past the peer review, um, the decision to participate in the program is entirely the authors. There will be none of this kind of like, well, you know, we want to publish your book, but only if you opt for the open access model. I mean, no, that's not how it's going to work. It's always going to be the author's decision whether she wants to participate in the program. Um, the decision to be a library member, of course, is also optional, even if it's Helvetica level. Um, it's, you know, you don't not get the book or anything. You still get all the the actual content is available to everybody. It's just we provide um, different levels of recognition, as I just outlined. Right now, we're publishing across the University of California Press's active monograph fields in the humanities and the social sciences. But that's not to say we won't expand into some of our other fields. You know, we just have to see how it goes. But this is specifically aimed at monographs in our active monograph fields. And uh, I'm pleased to say we've got nine titles already committed. We've got several libraries they are already wanting to pay us lots of money to be part of the library membership fund. And the first titles in this program will be publishing later on this year. Um, we have a, a great roster, an advisory board of, um, made up of librarians and scholars um, from all around the US and the UK. So that's really both of the new modes of publishing going on at University of California Press. Let's check how I'm doing for time. I think I've got plenty. So again, I think pushing ahead and you know, leaving questions to the end, I'll talk about some of the directional ideas that uh, Neil Blair Christensen and I are having at, at the UC Press. Where are we going? So again, we've just, there's a million ways to start ideating and thinking about things and you know, what hypothesis do we want to test and uh, where do we want to go? But I, I started to think about um, content in terms of the rawness and the refinedness of it. And uh, we decided that you know, journal articles are kind of somewhere in the middle as regards how refined and how much editorial work is done on them. And a book is probably further along the line. Um, so no change there. And that's really what you know, publishers like University Presses have focused on before. Um, we're very interested in going to what I've boringly called content plus here, but I could also call hyper-refined content. 
Um, very interested in working backwards, getting into the data journal and the database um, and data publishing kind of arena, and also going back to things like data sets and codes. Um, Post-publication organization of content. I made a point earlier, I don't know what I've just kicked here. Um, I made a point earlier about getting published in an open access mega journal is sometimes, it, the feel of it is kind of getting up to a minimum standard. And whilst that, because of the type of peer review that is employed over these journals. But I really wanna, we really wanna move the conversation, as I said, not just by kind of refining or revisioning the, the selective for credibility only style of peer review, but many, many people are publishing their best work in this type of journal. So I think the key is, is to not just um, highlight this work via publicity or writing blog posts, but really kind of look into the post-publication organization of content with what I'll call like kind of overlay meta journals. I mean, this is an, an original idea, of course. I mean, I, there are other publishers, including the Frontiers group, that have already been looking into this. But what I'm just saying is that we will definitely be looking into this a lot more. We're going to be thinking about how to extend the life cycle of an article upon publication. A classic maxim is to say, you know, getting your article published is like a tombstone. It's like the end point of your research. And we don't think it should be that way. So as I already said, with the hypothesis integration and the notion of being able to annotate and, you know, very smartly um, comment post-publication on content, I really want to kind of investigate whether we can start looking into star article overlays or regional article overlays or, you know, here's a bunch of articles that, you know, are all about Mediterranean biodiversity so they can sit in their own overlay. So really highlighting the content as it is published in these kinds of journals and not just kind of letting it sit there and not just relying on your publicity engine to draw attention to it. Contextually organized research objects, really another uh, bad day of thinking of cool titles. Um, it, it's, again, we're very interested in why we put, why all of our containers only have the same kind of object in them. What, why do journals only have articles in them? Why do data journals only have data papers in them? Why does data repositories only have data in them? I mean, that's not how people find stuff. We, we're just, we've got this hypothesis that when I'm addressing a topic or a problem, I don't just want the articles, I want everything. I want the data sets, I want the data papers, I want the articles and everything that's applicable to this question or topic or problem that I'm trying to solve. Um, so whether or not this is a kind of a new place or it's where people can submit directly to or whether kind of we think of a way of having like post-publication editors who can draw and link stuff into the same contextually organized kind of containers, um, I'm not sure, but essentially um, we're working with a lot of, with a few partners on how to kind of um, innovate around organization and discovery via research question and what you're actually addressing rather than what that content is and what discipline it's coming for, coming from. Sorry. Content Plus, I called it earlier and then I called it hyper refined content. Um, very interested in websites like howglobalwarmingworks.com. This is nothing that we've had anything to do with, but if you really want to check out um, a whole bunch of cognitive psychologists making videos about how to effectively explain how global warming works in 50 seconds or three minutes or five minutes, depending on how much time you have or how much time you have as an educator to educate someone else about this, check out howglobalwarmingworks.com because that's another thing that I'm very interested in exploring. In the UC system, sorry, the California, University of California system, there's a lot of these kind of climate change communication departments emerging where it's the people that study, you know, kind of why we all believe Sarah Palin and not Joe Biden when they kind of talk, et cetera. But, uh, you know, it's because it's of all the simple language and, you know, they've, they, they've done it like that. But um, it's the people that kind of studied that and now turning their kind of attention to how to effectively communicate things like climate change and climate science. So I, I definitely see an opportunity there of not just, you know, going to raw output, but saying, well, you know, really having multiple people work on something for two months, the output of which is a 50 second video. That's what I'm very interested in looking into. Um, advanced topic model and text and data analytics. One of the things in the, the STM slide that Garrett showed was open notebook science. We've got one of the pioneers of open notebook science sitting at the front of the room. I'm, I love this. I mean, open notebook science and blogging and science blogging is great. But if you think about it, it's more so than ever biased against people that don't write in English. It's all very well to you know, have that publication moment for researchers in Brazil or wherever to kind of prepare their article in English. 
But are we saying now, as we kind of highlight more and more um, the open and transparent communication of science as it happens, that people actually have to do their science in English for it to be able to be a participant in that community? I'm very worried about shutting out a whole kind of community of people that might otherwise you know, love to participate in open notebook science, but how do we do that? Talking with a very a bunch of extremely interesting people at Berkeley um, who have developed some very how can, what's the easiest way for a non-specialist to describe it? What they're doing is they're about you know, topic modeling, getting the gist behind scientific articles. And instead of translating the actual words that those concepts are described in, they're trying to figure out a way to how to translate the gist that is behind. So you might not get the full article as the output, but you will get a much closer to the actual meaning of the content that is behind this article that is actually written in English. So it's, it's linked to kind of a lot of people looking into the, you know, the triples and the semantic markup of language and nano publications and things like that. But um, I see a lot of kind of potential applications for it to kind of, for you to do a search and actually return everything and the search is returned to you in English, but it's actually searching um, a lot of science published in multiple different languages as well. Again, sounds like a big project for a very, not very small, but compared to where I used to work or compared to University of Chicago, a small university press. But this is the way to do it, I feel. I mean, I can't, we couldn't, you know, myself and Neil couldn't do this in-house, but the second you put it out there that you're interested in doing things in Skullcom that are not, not too publishery, we're not trying to force everything into the same containers and using the same mindsets. We're actually interested in meeting you as scholars where you are and what you're doing and seeing if we can be a bit more of a utility rather than an industry in helping to make that happen. So, uh, you know, the second you put that out there, and especially as a university press, you're actually attached to a university, going back to what Garrett was saying, suddenly your institution will actually be a whole lot more interested in what you're saying when you're actually not just talking about, hey, publish your book with us. You're actually saying, well, I'm very interested in what you're working on in text analytics. Can we come and talk to you because we have this idea? So I do think university presses are in a phenomenal position to do much more of this work because we are embedded in the academic community, you know, and in many cases, some of us just have to walk across campus to meet these people rather than, um, you know, do cold calls and emails to try and get meetings. Um, as I, I, I've said it before about, you know, Calabra, you know, we had everything we needed and nothing that we didn't to get Calabra off the ground. So everything we had, like a building, a marketing department, a publicity department we already had, all we didn't have was a platform that you could do it on, but we were able to get that via, you know, a, a, a collaborative partner who was using open source software. So I do think that uh, these are the conversations that university presses are extremely well placed to have, which I hope is one of the futures of um, university presses that uh, Garrett and all of us are looking for. Um, is this my last slide? Almost. Continuous upgrading of editorial systems. Editorial systems, the bugbear of all scholarly communication. Everyone either hates them or loves them. You know, I can talk about, if you talk about, you know, uh, the perfect example of the weirdness of doing market research is that I can go out to 100 people and 50 of them will tell me that the editorial system works great, it's stellar, it's absolutely perfect, and 50 people will say, it's, you know, it's the worst thing I've ever touched in my life. Please take it away from me. So, um, we, as I said, we work with Ubiquity Press, who are using the open journal system software, but really they've tweaked it enough that you can barely call it that anymore. But um, we're, we're investigating any and all opportunities to innovate around the systems and the databases that drive the actual activity of scholarly publishing. Again, we're not going to build this ourselves, but we can provide direction to the experts that are actually doing that and benefit from their innovation. And as I said, um, we're going to be working closely with the Center for Open Science, but I'm very interested, we're very interested in any and all kind of innovations, sensible innovations around pre-registration and transparency and emphasizing and increasing greater trust in science. I come from the psychology world, as I've already said, um, which was hit hard a few years ago by a lot of research misconduct and people making up data, a certain professor over in, um, in the Netherlands. So um, a lot of the, uh, in fact, um, transparency movement, you know, in, in addition to kind of cancer biology and a lot of the biomedical fields is actually coming from the psychology field due to the negative reason of there being a very high profile case of um, making up data. So 
Yep, just very interested in general with a lot of these ideas and expanding them into all fields rather than being focused in just these two, in, in fields where there's been a problem. I want to kind of, I'm very interested in making tra the transparency discussion as a positive discussion rather than a fix for something negative that occurred. Thank you very much. We're running a way ahead of schedule, so hopefully you have lots of questions, which hopefully I can answer, but um, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, I have a question about um, some of these new models where actually um, you get to, you, you know, where authors actually can publish uh, a, a chapter to start and then build sort of the, the, uh, the interest as they go around the community. Yep. And I wonder if you're also considering those kind of models as well, like... Yeah. We have not got any active projects exploring that, but I, I do like the concept. Um, it, in a way, it's, it's almost like a one step beyond like open notebook, right? It's you're, you're putting something out there at first for early comments, um, but uh, no, we have no projects underway which are about publishing a small selection and then anything more, but following all those projects that are doing that, yes. So you said something really interesting at the end, the, the idea of the artist formerly known as a publisher becoming a utility. So we've, we've, we've moved, we've moved, had this conversation about shifting from talking about content businesses to service industry. And now you're talking about being a utility, which is very interesting both in the context of the different sort of governance slash funding mechanisms, mm -hmm. public versus private utilities, yep. um, nationalization, of um, commercial utilities in the late nineteenth century, particularly in Europe, um, that, how does that how does that change the way you're thinking about the long term business models? Yeah, I'll I'll clarify that this is born. I'll, I'll give you the background to why I've used those words because it's it's again it's one of the one of those annoying things for me, just like peer review light. Um, I. I was always annoyed by the commercial publishing industry statement when they said about all the OSTP and the faster things like that, the, the, the legislation at federal and state levels that is introducing open access things. I would hear very angry people say they're trying to regulate us like a utility. And everyone would get very furious about that. And um, you know, whilst I'm not saying that I think publishing should become a utility or looking back on the, you know, the economic history and cultural history of utilities. You know, I, I see scholarly publishing as what is it, anything other than, you know, ignoring what you, the word utility means, it's a utility that enables scholarship to get out into the world. Yet because of the, you know, the, the way Garrett described it, the, the massive increase in the power of the industry really from the 1960s, you know, this, these are my own terms, I suppose I should, should just clarify. These aren't, you know, the traditionally used words. You know, the, the, the industry that just was born from that huge amount of money that was able to be made out of scholarly publishing just created an entity, in my opinion, that then now just serves itself. You know, it's about not putting, you know, the original creator first. And I and many others, you know, obviously, and I'm you know, probably the last person to join in, um, has just, you know, really wants a publishing services marketplace to kind of be the lead value add that publishers can do, can add. So, I'm, you know, I'm trying to, I suppose I should always clarify what I say about utility and industry with, you know, these, these are my kind of words for it. And I'm just very interested in publishers, if you look at, so there's a great um, poster that was presented at Force 11, and what I can remember one of the author's names, Bianca Kramer, and I think she's at Utrecht or one of the Dutch universities, they kind of showed the 101 innovations in scholarly publishing today. And I think most of them were from academia. Very few publishers were involved, or if they were, it's because they'd bought that company. Um, and if that's not indicative of there being something that publishers aren't doing, that I don't know what is. And in fact, there's a very good session coming up at the American Association for University Presses called When Publishers Aren't Getting It Done. Um, organized, I should be transparent, by my colleague, Neil. Um, but you know, I, I think it is clear that there is something 
scholars, scientists are doing things that publishers aren't responding to, or if they are, they're trying to say, well, yeah, come over here and put it in this. Oh, we just, we just put it in the same old box as before. You know, it's, it's, it's in a journal. Like even, I have a, like a small concern about kind of data papers. I mean, da data papers are existed because people have ignored data sets. So what do we do? We make it look more like a journal article. That's great. I love the kind of the increase in the kind of prevalence of data journals and data articles. But ultimately, it's not by design, it's by necessity to actually be able to get credit for it. So I'm very interested in general in trying to kind of get publishers being a bit more utilitarian and saying, how can we help you do that which you are doing, not how can we be an industry and force you to engage with us just as we are. Hi, I really like the idea of the uh, Calabra. That sounds great. But the question is, how are you going to get authors to back away from the uh, prestige publications that they need for their tenure and things? Even though we can show them stats that mm -hmm. you know, open access gets more uh, citations and things like that. But uh, unfortunately, a lot of departments and tenure committees are looking at the nature papers and the... Yep the big papers? Well, thankfully, that's not a question I have to answer alone. You know, that's, that's great. I mean, that's, you know, we're not the only journal in that, in that predicament. And so we can just join forces with the other, you know, newer or not so new anymore kind of open access journals and just always tell that story about your research will be just as discoverable, if not more discoverable, just as well cited, if not more well cited. Um, and, you know, it's, it's going to be a slow process, and I think all of us are surprised at how slow it has been. I mean, there are plenty of people, I guess, that aren't surprised. But, you know, I think some of the things I talked about, and I know that we're not going to be the only people doing this, is just highlighting amidst a very large journal. I mean, here's how I put it. A lot of the things that open access mega journals have intended to solve is not things that people shouldn't be doing. So being subjectively selective for content there's nothing actually wrong with that. That's not a bad thing. It's just that there's a lot of people that believe that's a bad thing, a gatekeeper to getting published. It wastes a lot of people's time, like this endless kind of rejection and going round and round journals. Selective, sub, selective, sorry, subjective selection is great post-publication. More the merrier people could come in and say, oh, look at, look at this corpus of 30,000 plus one articles. I'm going to select the best 100 that deal with this topic. You know, I think that's, that's great because that any kind of curation or organization of information is a great thing. I think the problem was that when it was the gatekeeper and the delayer of publication, that was when it was a problem in my opinion and many others. So I, I like, I just want to kind of keep telling that story of all the same things can happen. You know, someone can give you a gold star for your article, even if you publish it in Calabra, it just might be at a different point, or it might be in a different way, or you might only get into, um, you know, the star article selection kind of six months after you got published. But, you know, it's all based on people want instant gratification. You know, they know their article is good, and they want to be told that upon acceptance, and they do that by getting nature to tell them that it's a great article. I don't know, maybe there's more innovations we could do. For in academia, where it's completely normal to grade papers, I've always wondered why journals don't grade articles. If you think about it, it's like it would be the most natural thing in the world. You know, well, you got published in, you know, PLOS Medicine, but you get a B. You know, it's kind of good. But, you know, you're, th this article, you know, still got published in the same journal, but it gets an A. You know, I just, I do wonder whether there's more innovation that can take place to kind of talk to that instant gratification need, which really, in my opinion, is the reason why the, the glamour journals and the, you know, the top journals kind of persist, because it's not that, I think someone might even believe that they could publish their best work in PLOS One or Collabora and still get the same number of citations, but it just comes too late. They want it now. They want it upon acceptance. They want to say, I got this nature paper. And of course, you know, when it's on a resume or whatever, again, like a, if we start talking tenure and promotion, again, that's another three-day conference, not another one-day conference. So I won't go down that rabbit hole. So it's about, sorry, that was a long answer, sorry. Trying to tell the story that all the same things could happen, but it'll take time.
Okay. If all the people asking questions could say who they are, <laughs> please. I'm Carol Stuckey from the Rehab Institute of Chicago. Um, regarding Calabra's uh, community fund, how are the numbers breaking out? How many people opt to uh, fund other people? How many people? I, I promise I will tell you when we've um, we, we opened for submissions three weeks ago. So we actually haven't had a, a round of decision making on the, the pay for woods and the etc. However, we will make it transparent. Someone's decision of what they will do, I never want to reveal someone's private decision. So I'll never say, you know, reviewer, we'll never say reviewer Bob elected to take the money. Can you believe it? <laughs> you know, and he's, but what we will do is, of course, you know, either annually or, you know, it'll emerge what will be the best practice and the best way of doing it. Um, I definitely would want to show, you know, oh, 20% of people paid it forward, et cetera, et cetera. We did some research, of course, which may be or may not be indicative, depending on how much you believe in, in research like that. But, um, you know, we, we it, essentially it was a fairly even split. Um, what, when we asked people, what would you do? They said an even split, but we'll see. Hi, I'm Brenda Johnson from the University of Chicago. Thank you very much for your presentation. That was great. I've just come back from the Association of Research Libraries meeting out in San Francisco, and Brian Nosek the, mm -hmm. from yep. UVA, the founder of the Center for Open Science, is one of our speakers. And he talked about improving openness and reproducibility of research. One of the things he talked about was how the researchers perspective of openness was very different or quite different from libraries. They, for example, the researchers don't care as much about curation or metadata and all of that and, and how institutional repositories are usually not integrated into uh, a researcher's workflow. Have you thought about if presses have different ideas about openness or have you found that researchers have a different idea about openness than, than you do as a press? Um, I've certainly noticed that researchers in psychology have completely different notions of openness as researchers in other, you know, the, the, the disciplinary differences with what people know as open methods and open data even is huge. And when one of the kind of the projects of the Center for Open Science is to kind of create these badges and ways of kind of showcasing that you have open data and, oh no, this is not my laptop. My laptop has the Center for Open Science badges on it. Yikes. Um, you know, it's, it, that, that's, it's, it's been one of, and it's not a stumbling block. I mean, they'll get there. I'm on the badges committee. So it's about kind of, can we, how on earth do we get consensus about what it means? So, you know, we've been as, we've essentially borrowed heavily from PLOS's author guidelines. And we've uh, just asked people, you know, to make their data open. And we're very clear on what we expect of authors. Um, again, I'm more interested in seeing what standards emerge rather than trying to capture them all in one instruction. Right now, the author guidelines are the same across all of our three disciplines. But it might happen. I, I've discussed it with our senior editors, as I said, who are the senior strategic leaders at the journal along with us, to say, well, if we need to describe one thing one way for you know, behavioral science authors and one thing another way for humanities or you know, genomics authors, then that's what we will have to do. I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in getting a buy-in from a community-driven standard than trying to get all those communities into a journal-driven standard. So yeah, that might get super complicated, and there might, you need to, might need to one day select which guide for authors you look at and which instructions you need to check. But um, we're not, I think the answer, to, the specific answer to your question is, we don't know yet, we will see but I want to put in place things where if there is difference, it doesn't hamper progress. Uh, hi, my name is Jeffrey Little. I'm from Concordia University in Montreal. And uh, I'm curious about the Luminos um, dissemination distribution model, given that uh, so many libraries now pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for huge ebook packages, as we do with journals. And the expectation now is for Mark Records um, coming from the vendor. Um, notion of how Luminos expects libraries to give access to the books that they're 
supporting Mm -hmm. in that um, imagining ways besides the open web or people knowing that Luminos exists? How are people to find these books? Yeah. So they'll be on our own pages and, you know, feeds out to Amazon, etc. They will be, you know, exactly the same as our subscription books. And, you know, like the library membership does not buy you any of the services that you would expect as standard that would be standard. So mark records, etc. will all be, you know, the library membership is just this voluntary kind of NPR style model of contribution. So again, I probably can't give you the level of detail than someone who is actually from our books program would be able to give you. But the way I understand it is that there is no difference. It's as as these books would expect, as librarians would expect to get the records and the metadata for these books will be how they will be delivered. And the membership is just a completely separate issue that is about recognizing and electing to support. Sorry, I don't know many of the details, but uh, I can certainly put you in touch with the people that know exactly how that will work. Hi, I'm Chris Cronin. I uh, work here in the library and I oversee the cataloging operations. And I was really intrigued by, this is actually kind of a follow-up to that last question. You, you mentioned changing the discovery environment to support contextually organized research objects. And I think about those very mark records where we, we really do focus on what the object is, what it is about, maybe who created it. And I'm wondering if you could give some use cases for that change in that discovery environment to focus on the research question and and discovery by research question as opposed to Mm -hmm. what an object is and and maybe help us visualize what what that would actually look like. Right. I'll be very clear and say what I've been mainly focusing on is a human curated version of that. I would like to get kind of almost meta meta containers with editors who can say, oh, you know what, this data set and this code would go well with this data paper and this article and I want to present these together. Because again, I think there are people working on the automation of metadata for this kind of discovery. (laughs) There's a company called Sparrow, are you familiar with them? S-P-A-R-R-H-O. Startup based in, are they based in London, Cameron? who is looking at bringing all types of content from literature searches to you. So I would definitely, for your specific question, I think they would be a good organization to speak with. What I'm talking about is, I was thinking of so many people have know a colleague or a friend who always knows what to suggest that they look at. And this is an activity and it's a beautiful behavior in academia that isn't credited, isn't rewarded formally. So perhaps I should have given more background to this contextual discovery is that I would like people to almost do third party data papers. I would want, you know, here's a container where we've got the topic of, and I keep saying Mediterranean biodiversity because it seems to be at the top of my mind. Um, but you know, I would want a third party to say, well, well, here's a topic being explored. I just read this paper over here or I just found this, this data set in Figshare or Dryad, this would be really useful for the people looking at these articles. I want to kind of make, you know, like do a third party like ad or a data paper to pull that content to that place. And I don't know what level of credit they would be, but they spent the time and effort to try and make something more discoverable in a useful context. And I just wonder whether that's a new kind of credit that you could offer people who clearly do this and these people are great at it and they are wonderful organizers of content. And so it's about kind of crediting the people that are able to help people find and discover content. Like I said, there's a ton of people trying to do this in an automated and you know, machine way. And I, you know, if I, that's great, but the idea that we've had is to try and it's it's more linked to our kind of overlay style thinking of post publication action and curation and commentary. Uh, David Stern, St. Xavier University, down south around here. Um, first, the American Physical Society is creating virtual reviews that do something very similar to that. So it's already 
getting recognition because if you are accepted to put into a virtual view, that's great. But my question is, with this slide up here, you're looking for a win-win situation with libraries. Have you thought about um, focusing on open educational resource textbook alternatives on your platform? Because that's something that every library would kick in money towards if we could actually get a solution that would be an alternative to what we're currently struggling with. Yes. <laughs> We have thought a lot about textbook and textbook publishing and you know, the text in the classroom is what, you know, the new word for them, or books, books for use in educational settings of the classrooms. Um, right now, this is to solve, solve the problem, I guess I can say that, of the books that we publish the most of. So there is a priority for monographs in the humanities and social sciences. University of California Press, we do have uh, one or two textbook editors that are going to be you know, commissioning more textbooks. Um, so it will be a natural offshoot to include some of those discussions into models such as this. So again, we're not working on anything specific of what you describe, but certainly um, open education resources, which is kind of almost, you know, I would want OER and, you know, the can you call it, is it OER, gray literature, gray, you know, stuff. Um, I'm very interested in looking at things like case studies and seeing whether we can well organize case studies. And as a course of that project, a lot of people have been saying, well, why focus just on case studies? Why not expand it to all kind of OER content or style content? So yes, it's on our roadmap. I didn't, you know, we haven't thought about it enough for me to even put it on a slide of future directions, but um, it, it's there, but we're small. I definitely like to talk with you about it, though, when you know when it comes up, though, if that would be okay with you. I'll ask a question. Speaking of future directions, um, so with Collabra, the mega type journal that you're talking about, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you mentioned people being able to <laughs> do searches and get um, su subject specific papers that way out of a mega journal. What do you see in the future as the role of subject-specific kind of niche journals? Um, I'm thinking particularly about people who really find community in those type of journals. How do those live with these mega journals? Do, do they continue to exist? I hope so. I mean, I, we, invent, we came up with this because of an idea that we had to try and help circulate more money around the communities that put in that value that creates that revenue. Um, it's a question that I've heard a lot where I mean I, I, want, I presented Collabora to this kind of group of um, people in the addictions field who had like kind of very small journals and society journals and things like that and as much as they kind of liked the idea and were applauding this kind of approach they were like yeah but what, what does that mean for us? And the answer is actually quite good like I hope because in this model this does earn money for a third party. So my kind of vague, again, directional idea is, could you, if, if I'm already talking, if we're already talking about communities within the journal just organized by discipline, would it be possible to kind of integrate a society into this, you know, or a niche journal, and where the senior, you know, a senior editor at Collabora is like the top node <coughs> of an existing network that you've just kind of ported into this. And for everything that goes on in that kind of mini sub-universe, that 250 doesn't go into the research community fund, it goes to that society. The default for anything underneath that senior editor would be that the money that it gets shared with the community would default to one account, which would be the society. So I've discussed this with a couple of kind of smaller journals or small societies who, you know, we've worked out the scenario. If you, you know, how many articles do you publish a year? You know, if, if this was in, in Collabora, would this amount of return be okay? And, you know, so there is a potential to kind of leverage the Collabora platform and the Collabora universe to actually have kind of ported in networks. Now, of course, Collabora is one ISSN. You wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't be able to like, put a journal within the universe, or at least not in any framework that I can 
think of on off the top of my head right now. So it would almost be a virtual journal or a virtual sub-brand, but maybe that would be okay for some journals that might otherwise go under. I don't know. But it's certainly on the table, and it's certainly a conversation I'm actively happening, having with people, is that could Collabra serve as the framework that you could inject networks, which a journal is ultimately into, and could they survive with that, with the kind of the revenue sharing model that we have built in there? Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Um, thank you very much, thank Dan. You.